Our next speaker is Dr. Christina Hill. She's a professor at UC Berkeley and a landscape architect. Um, she is doing a lot of work right now looking at adaptation strategies in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and her discussion and talk this morning is gonna be looking at uh, different strategies for coastal landscapes. With that, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Christina Hill. The bright front lights down a little bit. Can't? Okay. Okay. I'll describe any slide that fits. Um, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. I taught at MIT for a few years, a uh, decade or more ago, and um, I have been working on um, thinking about coastal adaptation in the U.S. I started out thinking about it in Seattle. Uh, then I switched to the University of Virginia and worked in coastal Virginia on coastal adaptation. Uh, worked on New Orleans, have been working there for about eight years. Um, worked in the Bronx briefly while I was on the East Coast, and then um, have been working primarily now on the San Francisco Bay area um, with a couple of detours to Europe to learn about what they're doing. And actually, that's been extremely helpful. And I encourage everybody to think about what's happening in Europe and Asia as part of our uh, review of experiments and how we can learn from the ecological, social, and cost effectiveness of these different strategies. I'll talk about just a couple today. Um, and I take very seriously what uh, Jeff was just talking about. I look forward to thinking about how those effects here might um, influence choices. Um, as I said, I'm working mostly in San Francisco Bay where there are no hurricanes. This is the first time I've worked in a place where you know there are no serious major storms. Well, there are storms, but their version of a storm is called the Pineapple Express. And from an East Coast or a Gulf Coast perspective, it's not that big. It's small. Uh, so they can try some different things. But one of the things I find happening all over the world is that people get into this polarization of thinking about strategies. And they say, well, should we build walls like New Orleans has done? Thinking of the city like a kind of castle that needs a keep, that needs walls. Uh, which usually means the loss of all habitat, all um, intertidal habitat outside those walls, or should we abandon the shore? And I think really uh, the issue is that both of those are a false choice, and there are many things in between those, which we heard about earlier this morning from more of a property owner perspective, uh, some of which may be more short-term and some of which may be long-term. This image I really and like from New Orleans. It's uh, two girls who have climbed up, I think with some assistance, on this flood wall in New Orleans, one of these concrete flood walls sitting on top of a levee. And the biggest uh, insanity about building walls, not only the loss of habitat, but the loss of awareness of what environment we live in. As soon as we build that wall and we can't see beyond it, we forget where we live. And that's happened to a lot of people in New Orleans um, over the last 50 years as those walls were built. The alternative, of course, is something like Holland Island, the Chesapeake Bay, uh, this photo from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation shows the last house that was standing on that island as it subsided. And sea level rose about three feet, I believe, in the Chesapeake Bay area. Um, and these houses just literally fell into the sea and then were removed partially. Uh, some foundations are left. And it was very dramatic, very poignant. And the emotion about change and loss is a very big and important part of how we think about adaptation. We can't be all Pollyanna about this. We're going to have to really take into account how people feel about these changes and uh, figure out how, in, for example, design and aesthetic experience can help us to begin to adapt. This is an example from the San Francisco area. This is Chrissy Field uh, with the Golden Gate uh, Bridge in the background. And uh, Chrissy Field is an interesting example because it's part of the um, Presidio Spanish military installation. I won't talk a lot about the history of the site, but there's a big sand delta outside the Golden Gate, outside the mouth of the bay, that sends sand in through waves that are coming from the southern hemisphere up to the San Francisco area. Uh, and it deposits sand in this beach, but the beach was also built using sand along the shoreline. Um, it's right in the, the backdrop is the city of San Francisco. It's a pretty amazing place for people to learn about the coast and what's happening to the bay. It's actually now seen as the um, part of the uh, design ideas that are being used for thinking about San Francisco Bay in the future. Um, and this wetland here in this slide, you can see it's just behind the beach that's up there I showed you first. 
uh, it actually was made by doing something which is um, the root of landscape architecture, which is to dig hole and make mound. <laughs> now I have saved you a lot of money on a graduate education. I've revealed the intense trade secret. Um, and this is how Chrissy Field was built. They cut to make a wetland and they built the beach and the raised area of the historic field with the material from that wetland. And as long as you can keep that cut and fill on the same site, you can do it cost effectively. So I say this because uh, Chrissy Field has become an important example, but if I were to make a diagram, just to put it out there as a skeleton that you can hang the rest of my talk on, um, for what we might do with shorelines, if this is our typical scenario where here we have the land and here we have the ocean, if we could make the land side in this section diagram able to handle more water from stormwater runoff and make the water side higher um, and include a wedge of habitat, all the habitats from uh, transitional wetland zones, intertidal wetlands, out to eelgrass and oyster beds, um, then we could actually, by filling a little bit in the ocean, and cutting a little bit on the land, we might be able to cost effectively adjust flat areas to be very well adapted. Um, and I'll address, I haven't addressed in this slide what Jeff was talking about, about hurricanes here on the East Coast, but I will. But if you could hold this in your mind, that'd be helpful. Um, I, my first degree is in geology, so I'm you know, with you. Uh, the root of all knowledge is geology. And what I've been talking to people about around the world is uh, the need to pair landscape strategies with wave energy regimes. You can't just do what somebody did someplace else if you have a different wave energy regime. And by that I mean both your typical wave energy and your storm cycles, storm surges, um, wind-driven waves. And if we can learn to pair those things appropriately, we may be able to um, actually do a landscape-based adaptation. So here's the San Francisco Bay, here's the city of San Francisco, Chrissy Field is right here. I wanted to identify a few points in the bay um, where I could show you something about wave-driven, uh, wind-driven waves and how we might adapt. This is a wind rose, a typical annual wind rose. I believe it's from Oakland Airport right here, or uh, right here actually. And uh, you can see the prevailing winds are from the west and northwest and a little bit uh, from the southwest. And then there are some very fast winds that come in the winter, typically. The red indicates the high speed winds from the southeast and some others from the southeast. But depending on where you are around the bay, you're more or less exposed to those winds and the waves they drive. For example, down here in the South Bay, where the Cargill Company and others have been doing salt harvesting over the last hundred years, in big salt ponds that provides that amazing color when you land at San Francisco Airport. Um, these lines would indicate the fetch, the length of the surface that the wind blows over to, <clears throat> excuse me, towards this point. And when the lines of long fetch coincide with the directions that the wind comes from, that's when you have a high wind-driven wave energy environment. Does that make sense? So down here, even though there is a little bit of a longer fetch from this direction to that spot, there's not a lot of wind that comes from that direction if I look for the same compass direction. So it's not super exposed in that sense. Here on um, the island of Alameda, city of Alameda, there's a lot of different angles of exposure. Some of them are long, and some of them include some directions that fast winds do come from, from the west, slightly from the northwest, and even from the southeast. So that site is pretty exposed within the San Francisco Bay context. Up here in the very wealthy part of the San Francisco Bay area in uh, Marin County, um, there are some long fetch lines, some shorter ones, but that long fetch line does get some very fast winds. So as we think about what we're gonna do in terms of landscape strategies, we have to put this in the context of the physical world and consider not only the wind-driven waves, but also the whole hydrodynamics of the bay, which I'm not gonna be talking about today, but is in fact part of what we're working on with our scenarios. Uh, so just to give you some visual equivalence, here's a high wave energy environment on the open Pacific coast. Here's a moderate wave energy environment on the East Bay, where I showed those red lines heading to a point in the map um, near Alameda. 
Here's a sandy area with lower wave energy. It's in an inlet, it used to be a river. Now that river is dammed, so there's not much water coming out. And this beach is, re is um, renourished every five, eight years. So there's a lot of sand that's moved out to be a big bar off this. You can walk half a mile out into that sand at low tide. So it's very shallow. It's been shallowed. This is a new verb entering the lingo from uh, work in New York City. This part of the bay has been shallowed by beach nourishment. And then this is a very low energy environment with a marsh um, farther in the South Bay. So that's what these different energy environments look like. And um, I made these sections to try to show something about what happens. And I'll show some data about this from the USGS in a minute. But if, we're in an, if, if you're doing something in an environment where there's not a lot of extreme wave energy, it's possible to use silt and other materials to build a wetland right there on the shore. And on the land side, to think about using your cut as an area to store stormwater. Um, the higher the wave energy gets, the more important it might be to have something like a sandbar off that, on the toe of that uh, marsh. And the higher the wave energy gets, maybe you can't really keep silt in that environment. It's going to have to be sand, coarser and coarser grained. And then as you come to an environment with very high wave energies, maybe from hurricanes, you have to think about some kind of a breakwater and a sandy environment, and maybe marshes behind that. But dealing with the front of that, especially the toe of it, in a way that reduces the wave energy. This uh, really wonderful project, I think, which we're, people in the Netherlands are learning a lot from, but in the international community we're learning a lot from, is an example of placing a lot of sand. <laughs> this is 28 million cubic yards of sand, placed uh, by a dredge material, placed on the Atlantic coast of the Netherlands. And um, it, the intention of this is for it to erode away. It's a feeder beach. It's meant to erode to widen the coastline to the north and south. And just a year or a year and a half after it was finished, looking from now from north to south, sorry for the switch, you can see all that sand has begun to move along the coast. And uh, the Dutch are no fools. They are thinking about what costs more money and what costs less money. And if this works to nourish the same length of coastline to widen the beach and the dune system over the 15 years this project is planned to spin out for, it will cost 25% of traditional beach nourishment along that same length of coastline. So cheaper and much more effective at creating habitat because there are no bulldozers on this length of shoreline distributing sand, blowing it up onto the dunes for the 15 years of the project. So it allows a storm protection measure to also provide much better habitat than the Dutch have seen along their coast for a long time. And this is a permanent strategy for the Dutch. This is not something that they're thinking about doing for a few years and then moving to Germany. That's not uh, on the table. Um, this recent HUD-funded proposal from the uh, Rebuild by Design competition, which I think our next speaker will talk also about a, a different proposal for, uh, it's by SCAPE, and that's uh, Kate Orr's firm in New York City. Uh, and it shows in this white line a breakwater that's been proposed off uh, the shore of uh, New York City here. And that's going to be an important experiment also, uh, as we see what can happen with that breakwater. But the whole point of that is to reduce the wave energy of the hurricane and create new options for what can be done along the actual shore zone by reducing that wave height, wave energy. This uh, area of uh, San Francisco Bay, Corte Madera wetland, has been studied by the USGS and by the San Francisco Bay Commission to try to understand how wetlands like this can help to reduce wave energy and already do. And their uh, results that they released in 2013 showed that a wetland, um, this lower blue line here is the um, spring tide, the high tide of the year. And then uh, the red line shows a storm with a 50% chance of occurring. And the green line shows a storm with a 1%, so the 100 year quote unquote event. With a very narrow wetland of maybe 100 feet, or 200 feet, we could get 75% reduction in that typical event. With a wider wetland, we get a lot more reduction uh, down for the 100-year storm, finally down below 50%, more than 50% reduction if we get out to 1,000 feet of wetland width, which is not unachievable in shallow water bodies like the San Francisco Bay. So that's very exciting to see and to think about how those could have an effect. Now, it's not necessarily the plants. It may be the shallowing of the sediment 
The sediment itself does most of the work as far as they've been able to determine. The plants help, but the sediments do a lot of the work. So even if that washes away and you replace the sediment, you still get the benefits of reducing wave height as far as we can tell so far from these studies. So I just want to remind you of this basic diagram before I show a few case examples. Uh, on the land side, handling stormwater, cutting, and putting that fill on the water side um, with whatever arrangements of breakwater, sand, and so on out there at the toe that make that wetland and uh, shellfish environment possible. So I think that by combining human habitat with landscape strategies, we can actually have sustainable coastal cities. And I'm bleeding over into the next session's topic. But for me, landscape and built environment are wedded topics, uh, difficult and important not to separate. So I'm going to give a couple of examples. This is a, a project in the Netherlands that shows some high-end housing basically built in a wet pond surrounded by berms. And this is the kind of housing that we could build even more dense um, in areas that are managed for stormwater, where we maintain a base level of the water, but we have a certain amount of um, freeboard there to be able to accept more stormwater in these ponds. And I think it's a wonderful example of something that could be very attractive and even inspiring to live in while it actually does a lot of work for the whole community. And those developers and property owners can pay to make that environment better by buying their homes, make the infrastructure function better. This is flooding in Hamburg in Germany. This is a type of flood that occurs. It's about 9, 10 feet of flooding along the St. Pauli Wharf area here, uh, the old fish market building, if you know the city at all. Um, and it occurs once or twice a year right now, and it'll occur more in the future. Um, a development was put in called the Hafen City or Harbor City, which is interesting because it was designed by a Dutch uh, urbanist. And what they did was, in addition to having a regular seawall, they hardened the whole first floor, by which I mean there are no windows, there are no residential or commercial uses in the first floor. It's waterproof parking garages or earth underneath the building. And the Germans can actually build waterproof parking garages. I don't want to see Americans try that. <laughs> this is the view of it as the tides change. Here's that hardened first story. And you look out onto the, um, the old warehouse district here. Now it's all been renovated as pretty high-end residential. But let me show you what happens to this low tide level here. That's the high tide. You can see the top of the storm, the um, uh, seawall here still. And that's the storm flood. So it's right up there, three quarters of the way, two thirds of the way up the hardened first story. So this has not taken into account sea level rise very much. But the benefit of it is that it has created a model of floodable urban development. People are responsible to put their cars in the waterproof garage when the flood is coming. And this person must have been in Malaga or someplace and <laughs> forgot. But other than that one car, they seem to have done a good job of actually putting their cars away and avoiding the insurance costs. Um, of having to replace them. And then people actually bring their kids down to uh, hang out and play in the flood water. Totally the opposite of what we do in the United States with our um, mandatory evacuation process. In fact, when I was at a conference in Hamburg, I asked what it is that American uh, coastal engineers are particularly good at. And the German engineers told me, oh, yes, there is something. I mean, I knew there must be, right? We have all this coast. We have all these amazing universities. And they said, Yes, there is something Americans are really the best at. And I said, what is it? It's always dangerous to ask that question when you're overseas. And they said, evacuation. <laughs> so there you go. And then they said, actually, we're number two to Cuba, which is another story I'll tell you later. So floodable development is really tiered development, where you could have habitat. The Europeans have not done much habitat, aside from that project I showed you, um, the sand, sand, sand engine or Zandmotor in the Netherlands, but we could have habitat on the outside. And then there might be pathways or roadways or infrastructure, um, parks, housing in wet ponds, higher density housing, the next tier up, and the next tier up roads, and the next tier up interstates. So by thinking about where we place things and at what elevation, we might be able to actually have a coastline that we can continue to occupy, a shore zone that can be developed as a sustainable, sustainable city planning ahead for 5, 10, or more feet of sea level rise. And buildings have a certain life cycle, so it would be possible to plan this for a 50-year or 100-year cycle and then plan to take them down and replace them. 
So I just wanted to close by showing a few images in the Bay Area of um, what my students have proposed as we've been thinking about places along the San Francisco Bay shoreline. And this is a proposal for a very large new beach to protect a housing area in San Leandro on the East Bay. Um, because it's an area that gets high enough wave energy that a marsh probably would not work on its own, the marsh would be behind the beach. This is the uh, Bay bike trail coming through here, shown rather dramatically in black, but a bike trail. And this is a floodgate because, of course, we're going to have to be thinking about what happens at all the points where rivers, streams, and pipes come out to the waterline. And I think we'll talk more about that later today. So a huge beach, that could be a benefit. This is an example of a water treatment plant, a wastewater plant on the San Francisco Bay. Almost all of the wastewater treatment plants in the San Francisco Bay, and there are more than a dozen, will be affected by only three feet of sea level rise. So we have a lot of infrastructure upgrading to do. And one student proposed that we think about adding um, a low berm, that's a, a, a subtidal berm, but that allows a brackish uh, marsh to be developed here using effluent waters from the sewage treatment plant with plants like tule reeds, um, basically just a, a fast growing reed to build a wetland here and accrete because the brackish wetlands in the bay accrete much faster than the tidal wetlands. And they're mostly driven by plant material accumulation, so having the extra nutrients from the sewage treatment plant could make that work better. Uh, and then this student proposed thinking about um, an existing, the brown here shows an existing marshy area. This is proposed as a new site for the University of California here. And there's the Bay Trail, the bike trail here. Um, and he proposed putting in a breakwater made of stone with a sand shell around it or a sand sheath over it, I'll describe it that way. And that by putting that breakwater island in, he'd be able to um, get more marsh to accrete back in that zone that has riprap walls and other kinds of stuff left over from ideas from the 1930s that were put in place. So his goal was try to get more wetland by reducing wave energy with this barrier island, all artificially done. And then there's a major interstate highway, I-80, that goes along the shore here. This is the Bay Bridge. Uh, Berkeley is here, Richmond up here. And he proposed a line of these uh, breakwater islands that could accrete marsh that would help to protect that interstate highway, which is quite low. And of course, we all know transportation is one of the most vulnerable areas of infrastructure. So in summary, um, I'll just wrap up by noting that it does seem that landscapes can do an enormous amount of the work of adapting coastal cities to sea level rise if we match them to the physical world that we live in in terms of wave energy regimes. Um, and I didn't emphasize this as I was talking about my slides, but uh, it may be that these strategies, if put in place soon, could buy us time to develop more tiered development, floodable development strategies for how we live in these shore zones. And they might buy us 30, 40, 50 years before sea level rise, the rate of sea level rise accelerates to the point where we have to really invest to make things work. But we could be planning ahead. There are developers in San Francisco Bay at Treasure Island who were advised by a consultant and have agreed to create a savings account today, thinking in net present value terms, to be able to um, accrue interest on a savings account over the next 30, 40 years before they'll actually need a levy around Treasure Island. Um, but they're planning to do it with their own money, these developers, um, using this kind of savings account approach. That was what a net present value analysis produced as the best strategy. Personally, I think it's missing the point that those levies on the edge could actually be multifunctional and could serve as part of habitat and recreation today, and that those benefits aren't necessarily considered. But uh, tiered development, I think, the way that I, the example I showed you from Hamburg is one example, um, is really the best solution, I think, for where we're headed. And to me, the idea of leaving the shore zone is a mistake because then we'll stop uh, looking at where we live, stop understanding the dynamics of the place that we live in. And most people who think about leaving, abandoning the shore zone have not calculated the costs of removing all the infrastructure and debris from urbanization. Um, and frankly, having been a little bit involved in politics uh, during my career, I find it very hard to imagine in America the mayor or the governor who will promote abandonment um, or the property law structure in which we will be able to pull that off. Um, so I think that we're really looking at how to redevelop and not how to leave. And I think of that in a positive way. So thank you very much for 
Thank you.